403, Chapters 1 and 2 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 16 minutes and 50 seconds. Welcome to Craft Lit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road. New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 403. Such a nice boy. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Welcome to the official start of The Count of Monte Cristo. I am so excited. If you are a new listener to Craftlit, the way this works is there's a little bit of crafty talk in the beginning and then book talk where I introduce the day's chapters and then the actual book chapters and then a little follow-up and that's it every week. This week we're going to do chapters one and two of The Count of Monte Cristo. But before we get to that... I have some special news. If you received the Craftlet newsletter, then you know that Tuesdays, at least for the near future, uh, we're doing a little bit of an experiment. Dawn and Erica and I are going to be live streaming on YouTube. What does that mean for you? It means if you want to see us do the crafty talk, you can hop on YouTube live and and watch it. If you want to watch it later, it's going to be recorded and you can watch it just like you would normally on YouTube. And if you don't have time, don't want to watch it or don't like YouTube, don't worry because I'm going to pull the best of the audio out of the YouTube and put it here. It just became really hard for me to do the crafty talk all by myself. Um, I don't have time to do much craftiness lately, which is really sad, but it's really the way life is working out, so there it is. But Dawn and Erica are fabulous crochet, knitter, cook, (laughs) wonderful people. Erica is going to be helping to moderate the chat room, so you can ask questions from the chat room if you're watching live. And, um, And yeah, we did a test run last week, and... Ms. Thursday Adams was in the chat room with a few other people who whisked in and out, and and it was a lot of fun. So, that is a new Tuesday thing. It'll be 1.30 Eastern, 10.30 Pacific, and you can calculate from there. Uh, I even put a little handy-dandy time calculator in the newsletter for you. And if you want to call Craftlit and leave a voicemail message, we have our own call-in line at 1-206-350-1642. And if you live outside the United States, you can go to craftlit.com and there's a little black and white tab in the right-hand side that says send voicemail. And if you tap that, it will let you record from your computer and send a voicemail to me. And then I can play it and then we can hear what you have to say. I have one more quick announcement before we go to the crafty talk, and that is this. We are working through uh, maybe mm, two more weeks on the Miller's Tale, which will be our last Canterbury Tales for a little while. And then we're going to start Three Men in a Boat. And I mentioned before that John Scholes had originally been set to read Three Men in a Boat, and then... um, and then we lost him. He passed away last fall. So it's been, as you can imagine, very difficult to find someone to read when I had expected to work through the book with John, both for quality reasons as well as just missing John. But I contacted B.J. Harrison, who you may know does the phenomenal job of reading audiobooks over at Classic Tales Podcast. And he and I have been at this for about the same length of time, and it's just bizarre that we've never actually met. 
I hired him to read the book for us. And I am so excited about that. His voices are just dead on. He does such a lovely job interpreting books. And he's a really great guy. So, you know, big win all the way around. Very exciting stuff. So as soon as we're done with The Miller's Tale, we will start with Three Men in a Boat, To Say Nothing of the Dog, and Have a Ball. I know. It's very exciting. All right. With no further ado, here is Dawn of Crochet Compulsive, Erica, who you might know as the designer of Jane's Ubiquitous Shawl, and so much more in the Defarge books, and me, talking Crafty Talk. I took your advice, Don, last week, and yeah. I went and I found the pattern you were talking mm-hmm. about. Yeah. And I've got horrible screen burn. We've got a bright day today, which is not what we've had lately. And so I started using the yarn that I showed you last week. Mm-hmm. And I have started crocheting. Nice. Yes. I what do you use for markers when you do crochet? Do you ever use a marker? Um the clippy ones are the I never do. <laughs> but the clippy ones are the ones you would use. Yeah, so because good. otherwise it gets stuck in there and you can't move it. And you'd yeah. have to cut them out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That wouldn't be very good. No. No, but I was really happy. And the the yarn, um, this is the yarn from Japan. It's really nice to work with. Oh, good. You'll like it. And when you, after you block it, it'll just all open up and look just lovely. The pictures online, I'm going to have to put a link in the show notes to that um, to that pattern because the pictures are gorgeous. And yeah. the, there's my, ah, uh, the light. What if I do this? There. Yeah, you can see it's all pretty. Nice. So uh, our friend says that uh, I'm assuming this is she um, made some clippy uh, stitch markers. I guess she said she makes stitch markers. She and makes the ones she made stuff. are the clippy ones that uh, you you could use for either knitting or uh, um, crochet. And she ooh. says your yarn is pretty. It is pretty. Thank you. That's from Yokohama Mama. She brought it from Japan. Ah, just cool. And this came from uh, Renee, who is um, Revenant oh. on Ravelry. This is my this was my Christmas present. So it's it is Gosh. gorgeous, and it's I think it's a I think it was a merino silk blend. Let's see if I can get schmancy. It is schmancy. It's all, and it's nice because it's garter, so I can wear it <laughs> the way that I would wear it, which is oh my god, I've got to run out of the house and throw it around my shoulders. Nice. Is that another Martina Bame? We were talking about Martina Bame last week. Is that a Martina Bame? I think it might be. I'd have to go and compare it to the pictures in the the Ravelry. In the Ravelry. But I think it I think it might be because it's that same kind of short road. Yeah. Prettiness. Well, I'll tell you in a sec. Oh. Yeah. It might be is it Magrathea maybe? Um, is it part of the hitch um, part of the hitchhiker series? It Maybe. might be. I don't know. I'll have to ask her. Well, if I could type, I would tell you. <laughs> Very I funny. Hard. Maybe she said on here. Nope. I know she told me though. I'll find it. I'll find out. You will. Show notes. So I have things to show you. I actually thought about it this week. So yeah. after we talked last time, I actually cast something on. This is as far as I got. <laughs> This week. <laughs> now I don't feel bad. It's a it's a um, swatch I'm doing in hat form for a sweater in the round. Oh. <laughs> um, and it is the yarn. I have no idea how this. Oh, it's working pretty well, isn't it? Yeah. That's yeah. Pretty. So it is Briar Rose Fibers Charity. Um, and it is for a Chris is hosting a knit along for a charity donation. Sweater pad, sweater vest pattern called Mr. G's Memory Vest, and the uh, I can't remember. It's all or part of the no. You make a donation to I think it's the Alzheimer's Foundation, and then you get the pattern. You you know email the designer and say I made a donation, and she sends you the pattern. Um, 
So anyway, I can actually cast something on. That's really pretty. Which I love like, <laughs> yeah, which doesn't happen. That's a good thing because I have more. <laughs> we need have time. Thing, I love this. The other thing I did this week um, was rip back. Did I tell you last week that I had a sweater I knit for myself and it like was too short and the body didn't fit how I wanted it to? No. No. Well, I did last winter and I knew I just needed it to be longer because I wasn't wearing it. And I love the top. You know, I love how the yoke fits. I love how it fit to my bust. And then it just needed to be different on the bottom. So I I sent a little snippet of my yarn to Chris at Briar Rose. And she dyed a matching hank for me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I ripped back the body of the sweater. And now I'm re-knitting the body of the sweater from the bust down. Um, and so this is the oh, yarn. Can wow. you see? Yeah. Nice. That's beautiful. Oh, it's pretty. Yeah. This is her um, wistful. And wistful is, what is wistful? 50% alpaca, 30% merino, 20% silk. Ooh, nice. I need it. Yeah, it's really lovely yarn. It's actually the yarn that Brenda used for the sweater she did in the first book. The first Farge, yeah, yeah, for the, the Sistrata. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's the yarn she did with that. And the pattern of the sweater is Ready, R-E-D-Y. Cool. So when I get it far enough to try on, I'll try on and take a picture for you guys. Are you working with Chris um, still going to um, fiber festivals and things? Because weren't you working for Briar Rose for a little while? No, I wasn't. I've done some patterns for her, some crochet stuff for her, she's actually. Great. She is great. She's she's just, yeah, she's a wonderful person, and she's so talented as a dyer. And, yeah, I love how she runs her business, and, yeah, Chris is good people. And Erica has a question. Quickie. Yeah. Well, no, um, comment. i got to make it clear so you can see that's the exclamation point, not the, the question, question mark. mark. <laughs> um, no, before we get too far past it, I wanted to say that Heather, your shawl appears to be brickless by Ooh. Martina Bame. Ooh. It appears to be brickless. Cool. And it is Bame. Ha. Uh, you guys are so yeah, it's Bame. <laughs> you were all psychic last week. You didn't even know. <laughs> That's so good. We just like her stuff. I do. I Now I do, too, because it's really good. And uh, Don, on your Twitter feed, I hadn't seen any any fabulous recipes going by this week. Have there been any? Um, yes, but I didn't take pictures of them. We made the red velvet cupcakes. <gasps> you did. Yeah. So I will. I think there's still some in the house. So I'll take a picture. <laughs> I'll take a picture of them, and then maybe we should probably start a. Um, Maybe a thread on your Ravelry group to post the recipes oh, in. Does that that's make a really sense? Good idea. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe we'll do that. That'd be fun. So I'll try and take a picture of that and uh, get that out to you because those are really tasty. That sounds like fun. I the only thing I made that was any good was a um, chicken tortilla soup that had. Oh yum. Yeah, you know there are some nights when you just think mm -hmm. leftover chicken and what? Yep. Yep. I yep. was very happy with that. Yeah, that's an easy cool. one. Yeah. yeah, and that's a really good thing, too. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah, another one that's easy. Actually, we just made it um, for the kiddo's birthday, who was yesterday. The Barefoot Contessa has a recipe she calls Weeknight Bolognese, and it's delicious. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Mm -hmm. That sounds nice. Is you could put it on leftover anything. kind of stuff? It is not leftover kind of stuff, but you start with ground beef instead of all the complicated meats that have to cook for a whole day to end up with bolognese so but it's very it's really tasty and you can use it yeah we put it on pasta baked potatoes all kinds of things Ooh, that yeah. reminds me we got a recipe i'm trying to remember the name it's a it's a blog it's a texas dad who cooks but the the reason i found him was completely accidental we had um not last christmas but the christmas before my dad gave us pressure cookers um, gave my sister and me both matching pressure cookers and they're not regular stovetop ones they're electric which oh. kind of freaked me out at first because I have I have an old one that's great but this you know you push a button and it does whatever it does I was looking for 
a recipe for walking taco meat. Now, have oh. you guys heard of walking tacos? <laughs> yes. yes. If, you, if your kids do enough sports, you know a lot about walking tacos. <laughs> oh my God. We hadn't come into into contact with these until the boys were doing something at, at the school. Yeah. And, and I thought, <laughs> Frito taco in a bag? What could go wrong? <laughs> Right. So I was looking for a good recipe and I found this one and the dad has two different two different recipes, super crazy easy. One is for walking tacos and one is for Frito Frito pie. Hmm. And oh yeah, Frito one pie. of the two recipes spices the meat so differently. There's cinnamon in it and there's dark chocolate, you know, pressed dark chocolate cocoa powder. So it's like a mole almost. It is like a mole and it mm -hmm. is so addictive. The, the 15 year old, if I make it, he'll just come in from school and say, is there any meat left? <laughs> Scoop it up. It's so good. I'll make, I'll make sure I put a link to that out. Cause it's. Yeah, I do. So worth yeah. a try. I have some crafty, Yay! Some, some show and tell. I don't know if you can see how there's, there's mesh and then it extends. Yeah. So does it have it, an eyelet row in there too? It has eyelets. What it is, is it's like a, a Fibonacci sequence. It, the one row has one, the next row has one eyelet, the next row has two eyelets, the next has three, then five, then eight, then 13, then 21. And uh, it, must, it, it must be because uh, I watched um, Da Vinci Code recently. <laughs> that must have been what inspired that. I hope you enjoyed that. I sure have a lot of fun talking to them. So now, let's dive into our book, The Count of Monte Cristo. So, last week we talked a lot about the history and Dumas, and this week you'll get a small inkling of why the history is probably so important. And it'll be a little while before it becomes more clear why Dumas is so important. But what is super important right off the bat is that you not expect high art right away. Like I said before, there are moments when the writing is gorgeous. But this was just like Dickens, a book that was being written for public consumption in a weekly magazine. The goal was to keep you interested and to keep you coming back, not to blow you away with poetic turns of phrase. Not that that doesn't happen, just that that's not the point. The other thing to remember is that during the 19th century, a lot of popular fiction was what we would call melodrama. And you certainly feel in these opening chapters like you're being set up for a very simple kind of meta... Um, for a very simple, simplistic kind of melodrama. And you're really not. I mean, there are certainly elements of that in here, but like I said before, Dumas out Dickens Dickens in a lot of ways. And everything has a payoff eventually. We just have quite a bit of time that we can take in getting to all of the payoffs. Which isn't to say, by the way, that you have to wait until the end of the book for any payoffs. There are payoffs all the way through. He wouldn't have been able to keep people reading if he hadn't done that. It's kind of like the, the TV show Lost from years ago. You'd get one little thing answered, but a new mystery would show up. Dumas kind of invented that, I think. So the characters who are introduced to us in these first, uh, first couple of chapters, certainly the first two and, and mm, pretty much through the first four, you're getting character exposition. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Edmond Dantes, who is our main character, is simple. It's very easy for him to come across that way, I think, because he is being uh, put in a position where you are meeting all of these people around him, and they are far more complicated people. All, all of them are far more complicated people with a lot more things going on, and it makes you think that Edmund doesn't have anything going on. And it's it's not true. But his character 
his his character, his innate character, is being laid down very carefully in these opening chapters. And it it all matters eventually. A note on currency. You will hear many different terms for money in this book. And the translation that we are reading was translated in the 19th century, so it was all contemporary at the time. Even Robin Buss, in her new translation of The Count of Monte Cristo, leaves the money as written, because it's very complicated. The franc was the official currency at this time, and um, a franc was divided into centimes, which is uh, cents, pennies, a hundred pennies, and uh, decimes as well. So you got uh, like dimes in the United States. The exchange rate, roughly around the time when this book was written, was 25 francs to a pound sterling. So one louis was worth a little bit less than a pound. To put that into perspective, the cost to ride the mail coach from Paris to Marseille, going through Lyon, was about 145 francs, or about six pounds. And that may sound like it's a deal, but if you were a a working person, you'd be lucky to be pulling in 40 pounds a year, or a thousand francs. And if six pounds, or 145 francs, is what it took to get from Paris to Marseille, that's a lot of money. The only term I think that might be mysterious to us is the word supercargo. And the, the supercargo was a, a nautical term. It was a term used for merchant vessels. The guy who was in charge of the cargo, tallying it, uh, making sure it was all there, keeping track of how much money they spent in picking up the cargo, how much money they were supposed to make, Uh, exchange rates, all of that stuff. He was in charge of keeping track of all of those things, which means you need to have a very trustworthy person doing that job. It would be, if you were the the person who owned the merchant fleet, it would be incredibly important for you to know that you could trust that guy. And I think that's it. Let's listen to our first two chapters of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas Chapter 1 Marseille The Arrival On the 24th of February, 1815, the lookout at Notre-Dame de la Garde signalled the three master, the pharaoh from Smyrna, Trieste, and Naples. As usual, a pilot put off immediately, and rounding the Chateau d'If, got on board the vessel between Cap Morgion and Rion Island. Immediately, and according to custom, the ramparts of Fort Saint-Jean were covered with spectators. It's always an event at Marseille for a ship to come into port, especially when this ship, like the Pharaon, has been built, rigged, and laden at the old faux sea docks, and belongs to an owner of the city. The ship drew on and had safely passed the strait, which some volcanic shock has made between the Calasareña and Jaro Islands, had doubled Pomeg, and approached the harbour under topsails, jib, and spanker. But so slowly and sedately that the idlers, with that instinct which is the forerunner of evil, asked one another what misfortune could have happened on board. However, those experienced in navigation saw plainly that if any accident had occurred, it was not to the vessel herself, for she bore down with all the evidence of being skilfully handled. The anchor a cockbill, the jib-boom guys already eased off, and standing by the side of the pilot, who was steering the pharaoh towards the narrow entrance of the inner port, was a young man who, with activity and vigilant eye, watched every motion of the ship, and repeated each direction of the pilot. The vague disquietude which prevailed among the spectators had so much affected one of the crowd that he did not wait the arrival of the vessel in harbour, but jumping into a small skiff, desired to be pulled alongside the pharaoh, which he reached as she rounded into La Reserve Basin. When the young man on board saw this person approach, he left his station by the pilot, and hat in hand, 
leaned over the ship's bulwarks. He was a fine, tall, slim young fellow of eighteen or twenty, with black eyes and hair as dark as a raven's wing, and his whole appearance bespoke that calmness and resolution peculiar to men accustomed from their cradle to contend with danger. "'Ah, is it you, Dante?' cried the man in the skiff. "'What's the matter? And why have you such an air of sadness aboard?' "'A great misfortune, Monsieur Morel,' replied the young man. "'A great misfortune, for me especially. "'Of Civita Vecchia, we lost our brave Captain Leclerc.' "'And the cargo?' inquired the owner eagerly. "'Is all safe, Monsieur Morel, and I think you will be satisfied on that head. "'But poor Captain Leclerc.' "'What happened to him?' asked the owner with an air of considerable resignation. What happened to the worthy captain? He died. Fell into the sea? No, sir, he died of brain fever in dreadful agony. Then turning to the crew, he said, Bear a hand there, to take in sail. All hands obeyed, and at once the eight or ten seamen who composed the crew sprang to their respective stations at the spanker brails and outhaul, topsail sheets and halyards, the jib downhaul and topsail clue lines and bunt lines. The young sailor gave a look to see that his orders were promptly and accurately obeyed, and then turned again to the owner. And how did this misfortune occur? inquired the latter, resuming the interrupted conversation. Alas, sir, in the most unexpected manner, after a long talk with the harbour master, Captain Leclerc left Naples greatly disturbed in mind. In twenty-four hours he was attacked by a fever and died three days afterwards. We performed the usual burial service, and he is at his rest, sewn up in his hammock with a thirty-six-pound shot at his head and his heels, off El Gilio Island. We bring to his widow his sword and cross of honour. It was worth while, truly, added the young man with a melancholy smile to make war against the English for ten years, and to die in his bed at last, like everybody else. Why, you see, Edmond, replied the owner, who appeared more comforted at every moment. We are all mortal, and the old must make way for the young. If not, why, there would be no promotion. And since you assure me that the cargo is all safe and sound, Miss Morel, take my word for it. And I advise you not to take the twenty-five thousand franc for the profits of the voyage. Then, as they were just passing the round tower, the young man shouted, Stand by there to lower the top sails and jib. Brail up the spanker. The order was executed as promptly as it would have been on a man of war. Let go and clue up. At this last command, all the sails were lowered and the vessel moved almost imperceptibly onwards. "'Now, if you will come on board, Monsieur Morel,' said Dante, observing the owner's impatience, "'here is your supercargo, Monsieur Danglars, coming out of his cabin, who will furnish you with every particular. As for me, I must look after the anchoring and dress the ship in mourning.' The owner did not wait for a second invitation. He seized a rope which Dante flung to him, and with an activity that would have done credit to a sailor, climbed up the side of the ship, while the young man going to his task left the conversation to Donglar, who now came towards the owner. He was a man of twenty-five or twenty-six years of age, of unprepossessing countenance, obsequious to his superiors, insolent to his subordinates, and this in addition to his position as responsible agent on board, which is always obnoxious to the sailors, made him as much disliked by the crew as Edmund Dante was beloved by them. "'Well, Monsieur Morel,' said Donglar, "'you have heard of the misfortune that has befallen us?' "'Yes, yes, uh, poor Captain Leclerc. "'He was a brave and honest man, "'and a first-rate seaman, "'one who had seen long and honourable service.' as became a man charged with the interests of a house so important as that of Morel and Son, replied Donglar. But, replied the owner, glancing after Dante, who was watching the anchoring of his vessel, it seems to me 
that a sailor needs not be so old as you say, Donglar, to understand his business. For our friend Edmund seems to understand it thoroughly and not to require instruction from anyone. Yes, said Donglar, darting at Edmund a look gleaming with hate. Yes, uh, he is young, and youth is invariably self-confident. Scarcely was the captain's breath out of his body when he assumed the command without consulting anyone, and he caused us to lose a day and a half at the island of Elba, instead of making for Marseille direct. As to taking command of the vessel, replied Morel, that was his duty as captain's mate. As to losing a day and a half off the island of Elba, he was wrong unless the vessel needed repairs. The vessel was in as good condition as I am, and as I hope you are, Monsieur Morel, and this day and a half was lost from pure whim for the pleasure of going ashore and nothing else. Dante, said the ship owner, turning towards the young man, uh, come this way. In a moment, sir, answered Dante, and I'm with you. Then calling to the crew, he said, let go. The anchor was instantly dropped, and the chain ran rattling through the porthole. Dante continued at his post in spite of the presence of the pilot, until this manoeuvre was completed. And then he added, Half master colours, and square the yards. You see, said Donglar, he fancies himself captain already upon my word. And so in fact he is, said the owner. Except your signature and your partner's, Monsieur Morel. And why should he not have this? asked the owner. He is young, it is true, but he seems to me a thorough seaman and of full experience. A cloud passed over Donglar's brow. Your pardon, Monsieur Morel, said Dante, approaching. The vessel now rides at anchor, and I am at your service. You hailed me, I think. Donglar retreated a step or two. I wish to inquire why you stopped at the island of Elba. I do not know, sir. It was to fulfill the last instructions of Captain Leclerc, who, when dying, gave me a packet for Marshal Bertrand. Then did you see him, Edmond? Who? The Marshal. Yes. Morel looked around him, and then drawing Dante on one side, he said suddenly, And how is the Emperor? Very well, as far as I could judge from the sight of him. You saw the emperor, then? He entered the marshal's apartment while I was there. And you spoke to him? Why, it was he who spoke to me, sir, said Dante with a smile. And what did he say to you? Asked me questions about the vessel, the time she left Marseille, the course she had taken, and what was her cargo. I believe if she had not been laden, and I had been her master, I, he would have bought her. But I told him I was only mate, and that she belonged to the firm of Morel and Son. Ah, oh, yes, he said. I know them. The Morels have been shipowners from father to son. And there was a Morel who served in the same regiment with me when I was in garrison at Valence. Par Dieu, and that is true, cried the owner, greatly delighted. And that was Policar Morel, my uncle, who was afterwards a captain. Dante, you must tell my uncle that the emperor remembered him, and you will see it will bring tears into the old soldier's eyes. Come, come, continued he, patting Edmund's shoulder kindly. You did very right, Dante, to follow Captain Leclerc's instructions and touch at Elba. Although, if it were known that you had conveyed a packet to the marshal, and that conversed with the emperor, it might bring you into trouble. How could that bring me into trouble, sir? asked Dante, for I did not even know of what I was the bearer, and the emperor merely made such inquiries as he would of the first comer. But pardon me, here are the health officers and the customs inspectors coming alongside. And the young man went to the gangway. As he departed, Donglar approached and said, Well, 
It appears that he has given you satisfactory reasons for his landing at Porto Ferraio. Yes, most satisfactory, my dear Donglar. Well, so much the better, said the supercargo, for it is not pleasant to think that a comrade has not done his duty. Don't say has done his, replied the owner, and that is not saying much. It was Captain Leclerc who gave orders for this delay. Talking of Captain Leclerc, has not Dante given you a letter from him? To me? No. Was there one? I believe that, besides the packet, Captain Leclerc confided a letter to his care. Of what packet are you speaking, Donglar? Why... That which Dante left at Porto Ferraio. How do you know he had a packet to leave at Porto Ferraio? Donglar turned very red. I was passing close to the door of the captain's cabin, which was half open, and I saw him give the packet and letter to Dante. He did not speak to me of it, replied the shipowner. But if there be any letter, he will give it to me. Donglar reflected for a moment. Then, Monsieur Morel, I beg of you, said he, not to say a word to Dante on the subject. I may have been mistaken. At this moment, the young man returned. Donglar withdrew. Well, my dear Dante, are you now free? inquired the owner. Yes, sir. You have not been long detained. No, I gave the custom house officers a copy of our bill of lading. And as to the other papers, they sent a man off with the pilot to whom I gave them. Then you have nothing more to do here. No, everything is all right now. Then you can come and dine with me. I really must ask you to excuse me, Monsieur Morel, my first visit is due to my father, though I am not the less grateful for the honour you have done me. Right, Dante, quite right. I always knew you were a good son. And, inquired Dante with some hesitation, do you know how my father is? Well, I believe, my dear Edmond, though I have not seen him lately. Yes, he likes to keep himself shut up in his little room. That proves, at least, that he was wanted for nothing during your absence. Dante smiled. My father is proud, sir, and if he had not a meal left, I doubt if he would have asked anything from anyone, except from heaven. Well then, after this first visit has been made, we shall count on you. I must again excuse myself, Monsieur Morel, for after this first visit has been paid, I have another which I am most anxious to pay. True, Dante. I forgot. There was at the Catalans someone who expects you no less impatiently than your father, the lovely Mercedes. Dante blushed. Aha, said the shipowner. I am not in the least surprised, for she has been to me three times, inquiring if there were any news of the pharaoh. Best, Edmond, you have a very handsome mistress. She is not my mistress, replied the young sailor gravely. She is my betrothed. Sometimes a one and the same thing, said Morel with a smile. Not with us, sir, replied Dante. Well, well, my dear Edmond, continued the owner, don't let me detain you. You have managed my affairs so well that I ought to allow you all the time you require for your own. Do you want any money? No, sir, I have all my pay to take. Nearly three months' wages. You are a careful fellow, Edmond. Say I have a poor father, sir. Yes, yes, I know how good a son you are. So now hasten away to see your father. I have a son too, and I should be very wroth with those who detained him from me after three months' voyage. Then I have your leave, sir? Yes, if you have nothing more to say to me. Nothing. Captain Leclerc did not, 
uh, before he died, give you a letter from me? He was unable to write, sir. But that, that reminds me that I must ask you leave of absence for some days. To get married? Yes, first, and then go to Paris. Very good. Have what time you require, Dante. It will take quite six weeks to unload the cargo, and we cannot get you ready for sea until three months after that. Only be back in three months. For the fair one, added the owner, patting the young sailor on the back, cannot sail without her captain. Without her captain? cried Dante, his eyes sparkling with animation. Pray mind what you say, for you are touching on the most secret wishes of my heart. Is it really your intention to make me captain of the Pharaon? If I were sole owner, we'd shake hands on it now, my dear Dante, and call it settled. But I have a partner, and you know the Italian proverb, Chi ha compagno ha padrone. He who has a partner has a master. But the thing is at least half done, as you have one out of two votes. Rely on me to procure the other. I will do my best. Ah, oh, Monsieur Morel, exclaimed the young seaman, with tears in his eyes, and grasping the owner's hand. Monsieur Morel, I thank you in the name of my father and of Mercedes. That's all right, Edmond. There's a providence that watches over the deserving. Go to your father. Go and see Mercedes, and afterwards uh, come to me. Shall I row you ashore? No, thank you. I shall remain and look over the accounts with Donglar. Have you been satisfied with him this voyage? That is according to the sense you attach to the question, sir. Do you mean, is he a good comrade? No. Uh, for I think he never liked me since the day when I was silly enough. After a little quarrel, we had to propose to him to stop for ten minutes at the island of Monte Cristo to settle the dispute, a proposition which I was wrong to suggest, and he quite right to refuse. If you mean as responsible agent, when you ask me the question, I believe there is nothing to say against him, and that you would be content with the way in which he has performed his duty. But tell me, Dante, if you had command of the Pharaon, should you be glad to see Donglar remain? Captain or mate, Monsieur Morel, I shall always have the greatest respect for those who possess the owner's confidence. That's right, that's right, Dante. I see you are a thoroughly good fellow, and will detain you no longer. Go, for I see how impatient you are. Then I have leave? Go, I tell you. May I have the use of your skiff? Certainly. Then, for the present, Monsieur Morel, fa farewell and a thousand thanks. I hope soon to see you again, my dear Edmond. Good luck to you. The young sailor jumped into the skiff and sat down in the stern sheets with the order that he be put ashore at La Canabière. The two oarsmen bent to their work, and the little boat glided away as rapidly as possible in the midst of the thousand vessels which choke up the narrow way which leads between the two rows of ships from the mouth of the harbour to the Quai d'Orléans. The shipowner, smiling, followed him with his eyes until he saw him spring out on the quay and disappear in the midst of the throng, which from five o'clock in the morning until nine o'clock at night, swarms in the famous street of La Canabière, a street of which the modern Phocéans are so proud that they say with all the gravity in the world, and with that accent which gives so much character to what is said, if Paris had La Canabière, Paris would be a second Marseille. On turning round, the owner saw Donglard behind him, apparently awaiting orders, but in reality also watching the young sailor. But there was a great difference in the expression of the two men who thus followed the movements of Edmond Dante. End of chapter one. Chapter two. Father and son. We will leave Donglar struggling with the demon of hatred 
and endeavouring to insinuate in the ear of the shipowner some evil suspicions against his comrade, and followed Dante, who, after having traversed La Canabière, took the Rue de Noailles and entered a small house on the left of the Allée de Mayen, rapidly ascended four flights of a dark staircase, holding the baluster with one hand, while with the other he repressed the beatings of his heart and paused before a half-open door from which he could see the whole of a small room. This room was occupied by Dante's father. The news of the arrival of the pharaoh had not yet reached the old man, who, mounted on a chair, was amusing himself by training with trembling hand the nasturtiums and sprays of clematis that clambered over the trellis at his window. Suddenly, he felt an arm thrown around his body, and a well-known voice behind him exclaimed, A father, a dear father! The old man uttered a cry and turned round. Then, seeing his son, he fell into his arms, pale and trembling. What ails you, my dearest father? Are you ill? inquired the young man, much alarmed. No, no, my dear Edmond, my boy, my son. No, but I did not expect you. And joy, the surprise of seeing you so suddenly. Oh, I feel as if I'm going to die. Come, come, cheer up, my dear father. It is I, really I. They say joy never hurts, and so I came to you without any warning. Come now, do smile, instead of looking at me so solemnly. Here I am, back again, and we are going to be happy. Yes, yes, my boy, so we will, so we will replied the old man. But how shall we be happy? Shall you never leave me again? Come, tell me all the good fortune that has befallen you. God forgive me, said the young man, for rejoicing at happiness I derived from the misery of others. But heaven knows I did not seek this good fortune. It has happened and I really cannot pretend to lament it. The good Captain Leclerc is dead, father and it is probable that, with the aid of Monsieur Morel, I shall have his place. Do you understand, father? Only imagine me a captain at twenty, with a hundred louis pay, and a share in the profits. Is this not more than a poor sailor like me could have hoped for? Yes, my dear boy, replied the old man. It is very fortunate. Well then, with the first money I touch, I mean you to have a small house with a garden in which to plant clematis, nasturtium and honeysuckle. But what ails you, father? Are you not well? It is nothing, nothing. It will soon pass away. And as he said so, the old man's strength failed him, and he fell backwards. Come, come, said the young man. A glass of wine, father, will revive you. Where do you keep your wine? No, no thanks. You need not look for it. I do not want it, said the old man. Yes, yes, father, tell me where it is. And he opened two or three cupboards. It is no use, said the old man. There is no wine. What, no wine? said Dante, turning pale and looking alternately at the hollow cheeks of the old man and the empty cupboards. What, no wine? Have you wanted money, father? I want nothing now that I have you, said the old man. Yet, stammered Dante, wiping the perspiration from his brow, yet I gave you two hundred francs when I left, three months ago. Yes, yes, Edmund, that is true, but you forgot at the time a little debt to our neighbor, Gadarus. He reminded me of it, telling me if I did not pay for you, he would be paid by Monsieur Morel, and so you see lest he might do you an injury. Well? Why, I paid him. But, cried Dante, it was a hundred and forty francs I owed Cadrus. Yes, stammered the old man. And you paid him out of the two hundred francs I left you? The old man nodded. So that you have lived for three months on sixty francs?
muttered Edmond. You know how little I require, said the old man. Heaven pardon me, cried Edmund, falling on his knees before his father. What are you doing? You have wounded me to the heart. Never mind it, for I see you once more, said the old man, and now it's all over. Everything is all right again. Yes, I, I am here, said the young man, with a promising future and a little money. Here, father, here, he said. Take this, take it, and send for something immediately. And he emptied his pockets on the table, the contents consisting of a dozen gold pieces, five or six fry franc pieces and some smaller coin. The countenance of old Dante brightened. Whom does this belong to? he inquired. To me, to you, to us. Take it, uh, buy some provisions, be happy, and tomorrow we shall have more. Gently, gently, said the old man with a smile, and by your leave, I will use your purse moderately, for they would say, if they saw me buy too many things at a time, that I had been obliged to await your return in order to be able to purchase them. Do as you please, but first of all, pray have a servant, father. I would not have you left alone so long. I have some smuggled coffee and the most capital tobacco in a small chest in the hold, which you shall have tomorrow. But hush, here comes somebody. It is Caderousse, who has heard of your arrival, and no doubt comes to congratulate you on your fortunate return. Ah, lips that say one thing, while the heart thinks another, murmured Edmond. But never mind, he is a neighbor who has done us a service on a time, so he's welcome. As Edmond paused, the black and bearded head of Caderousse appeared at the door. He was a man of twenty-five or six, and held a piece of cloth which, being a tailor, he was about to make into a coat lining. "'What is it, you, Edmond, back again?' said he with a broad Marseillaise accent, and a grin that displayed his ivory-white teeth. "'Yes, yes, as you see, neighbour Caderousse, and ready to be agreeable to you in any and every way,' replied Dante, but ill-concealing his coldness under his cloak of civility. "'Thanks, thanks, but fortunately I do not want for anything, and it chances that at times there are others who have need of me,' Dante made a gesture. "'I do not allude to you, my boy. No, no, I lent you money, and you returned it. That's like good neighbours, and we are quits.' "'We are never quits with those who oblige us,' was Dante's reply. "'For when we do not owe them money, we owe them gratitude.' What's the use of mentioning that? What is done is done. Let us talk of your happy return, my boy. I had gone on the quay to match a piece of mulberry cloth when I met a friend, Donglar. You at Marseille? Yes, he says. I thought you were at Smyrna. I was, but now I am back again. And where is the dear boy, our little Edmond? Why, with his father, no doubt, replied Donglar. And so I came, added Caderousse, so fast as I could, to have the pleasure of shaking hands with a friend. Worthy Caderousse, said the old man, he is so much attached to us. Yes, to be sure I am. I love and esteem you, because honest folks are so rare. But it seems you have come back rich, my boy, continued the tailor, looking askance at the handful of gold and silver which Dante had thrown on the table. The young man remarked the greedy glance which shone in the dark eyes of his neighbour. "'Eh,' he said negligently, "'this money is not mine. I was expressing to my father my fears that he had wanted many things in my absence, and to convince me he emptied his purse on the table. "'Come, father,' added Dante, "'put this money back in your box, unless neighbour Caderousse wants anything, and in that case it is at his service.' No, no, my boy, no, said Caderousse. I am not in any want. Thank God, my living is suited to my means. 
Keep your money. Keep it, I say. One never has too much. But at the same time, my boy, I am as much obliged by your offer as if I took advantage of it. It was offered with good will, said Dante. No doubt, my boy, no doubt. Well, you stand well with Monsieur Morel, I hear. Are you insinuating dog you? And Monsieur Morel has always been exceedingly kind to me, replied Dante. Then you were wrong to refuse to dine with him. What? Did you refuse to dine with him? said old Dante. And did he invite you to dine? Yes, my father, replied Edmond, smiling at his father's astonishment at the excessive honour paid to his son. And why did you refuse, my son? inquired the old man. That I might sooner see you again, my dear father, replied the young man. I was most anxious to see you. But it must have vexed Monsieur Morel good, worthy man, said Caderousse. And when you are looking forward to be captain, it was wrong to annoy the owner. But I explained to him the cause of my refusal, replied Dante, and I hope he fully understood it. Yes, but to be captain one must do a little flattery to one's patrons. I hope to be captain without that, said Dante. So much the better, so much the better. Nothing will give greater pleasure to all your old friends, and I know one down there behind the San Nicolas Citadel who will not be sorry to hear it. Mercedes, said the old man. Yes, my dear father. And with your permission, now I have seen you, and know you are well, and have all you require, I will ask your consent to go and pay a visit to the Catalans. Go, my dear boy, said the old Dante, and heaven bless you in your wife, as it has blessed me in my son. His wife, said Caderousse. Why, how fast you go on, Father Dante. She is not his wife yet, as it seems to me. So, but according to all probability, she soon will be, replied Edmond. Yes, yes, said Caderousse, but you are right to return as soon as possible, my boy. And why? Because Mercedes is a very fine girl, and fine girls never lack followers. She particularly has them by dozens. Really? answered Edmund with a smile which had in it traces of slight uneasiness. Ah, yes, continued Caderousse, and the capital offers too. But you know, you will be captain, and who could refuse you then? Meaning to say, replied Dante with a smile which but ill concealed his trouble, that if I were not a captain? Hey, said Caderousse, shaking his head. Come, come, said the sailor, I have a better opinion than you of women in general, and of Mercedes in particular and I am certain that, captain or not, she will remain ever faithful to me. So much the better, so much the better, said Caderousse. When one is going to be married, there is nothing like implicit confidence. But never mind that, my boy. Go and announce your arrival, and let her know all your hopes and prospects. I will go directly, was Edmund's reply, and embracing his father, and nodding to Caderousse, he left the apartment. Caderousse lingered for a moment, then taking leave of old Dante, he went downstairs to rejoin Donglar, who awaited him at the corner of the Rue Senac. Well, said Donglar, did you see him? I have just left him, answered Caderousse. Did he allude to his hope of being captain? He spoke of it as a thing already decided. Indeed, said Donglar. He is in too much hurry, it appears to me. Why, it seems Monsieur Morel has promised him the thing. So that he is quite elated about it? Why, yes. He is actually insolent over the matter, has already offered me his patronage as if he were a grand personage, and offered me a loan of money as though he were a banker. Which you refused? Most assuredly, although I might easily have accepted it, for it was I who put into his hands the first silver he ever earned, 
But now Monsieur Dante has no longer any occasion for assistance. He is about to become a captain. Pooh, said Donglar. He is not one yet. Ma foi, it'll be as well if he is not, answered Caderousse. For if he should be, there will be really no speaking to him. If we choose, replied Donglar, he will remain what he is and perhaps become even less than he is. What do you mean? Nothing. I was speaking to myself. And is he still in love with the Catalan? Over head and ears. But unless I am much mistaken, there will be a storm in that quarter. Explain yourself. Why should I? It is more important than you think, perhaps. You do not like Dante. I never like upstarts. Then tell me all you know about the Catalan. I know nothing for certain. Only I have seen things which induce me to believe, as I told you, that the future captain will find some annoyance in the vicinity of the Vieille Infirmiere. What have you seen? Come, tell me. Well, every time I see Mercedes come into the city, she has been accompanied by a tall, strapping, black-eyed Catalan with a red complexion, brown skin, and fierce air, whom she calls Cousin. Really? And you think this cousin pays her attentions? I only suppose so. What else can a strapping chap of twenty-one mean, with a fine wench of seventeen? And you say that Dante has gone to the Catalans? He went before I came down. Let us go the same way. We will stop at La Reserve and we can drink a glass of La Malgue whilst we wait for news. Come along, said Caderousse, but you pay the score. Of course, replied Donglar. And going quickly to the designated place, they called for a bottle of wine and two glasses. Père Pomphile had seen Dante pass not ten minutes before, and assured that he was at the Catalans, they sat down under the budding foliage of the plains and sycamores, in the branches of which the birds were singing their welcome to one of the first days of spring. End of chapter 2 Recording by David Clark Isn't Edmund a nice boy? <laughs> I know, I know, but he is. He's a good boy. He loves his dad. He loves his woman. He has a really neighbor. Caderousse is a punk. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe him. He's a punk. And it is a little hard to understand how he could not have noticed that Edmund's father was really, really short on money. Thus, the punk. But he's one of the people that we pay attention to. I'm sure you picked up on the fact that the other person, so far, who we should be paying attention to is Dongla. Lovely chap, right? <sighs> oh, he drives me crazy. And the other thing to pay attention to is something that I talked to Roger about last week, which is that the, the literary center of France at the time was Paris. And that means books took place in Paris. The authors lived in Paris. It was just the, the hub of everything. For Dumas to start this story in Marseille, and not just in Marseille, but down by the dockside, was a surprise to everyone. Marseille was an interesting town at the time. It was obviously a, a very main, important shipping port in the Mediterranean. So it was a surprise that the book starts here, in, in this location. And Marseille is a, it's a big city already. Uh, it's obviously not Paris. But it's interesting that it seems to have a dockside where the image I got was, you know, barefoot little boys running down to the port to see the boats come in. 
So it's it's still got that, but at the same time, it still has actual trade and commerce, big stuff going through. And people like Monsieur Moral, who is clearly doing well. So Marseille is an interesting, complicated place, and not Paris. Next week, we will meet the next, let's see, one, two, the next two important people. It'll be a little bit longer before we meet the next two after them. And I think that's it for this week. I did want to send a special thank you to the patrons over at Patreon. Your support for the show over the years has meant the world to me. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to keep bringing you fantastic annotated audiobooks. All right. Take care. Have a great one. Talk to you soon. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlet.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlet has been kept going by the support of you, the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on 